last uh, or this earlier this week, it seems like it's been forever, but I was in New York at a microcap conference where a lot of the companies that uh, um, DAX covers attended. Uh, it, it had all different um, kinds of uh, companies there, not just biotech and healthcare. <coughs> but um, uh, there were a number of biotech companies there, and, and I, I moderated a panel talked about a, a bunch of topics. They're, they're focused on investor concerns. And one of the big things in healthcare is pricing and it's inflation. And the statistic that I like to bring up is that um, healthcare is 18% of gross domestic product. And that compares to 13% back in 2000. So it's increased dramatically. And I mean, if you go back even to like the 1970s, it was it was in the single digits. So it's dramatically increased over time. So the share of every dollar that's earned by Americans, more and more of it over time has gone to healthcare, right? So a lot of investors are concerned that that's not, that's not sustainable, right? And then, you know, another statistic is that 10% of that spend on, on um, healthcare is drugs, pharmaceuticals. And that's actually growing a little bit faster. Uh, there's one category in particular that, that has been growing pretty fast, biologics. I don't know if anyone's heard of Keytruda, or you know, so that that was the the drug that cured Jimmy Carter's melanoma. I like to use that example because that was pretty well broadcasted. But these are these are manufactured by cells, and they're very expensive. And part of the reason for that is because the the process is not a chemical process. <clears throat> you have to put them in bioreactors, and it takes a long time, and there's a lot of you know controls that need to be put in place. So they're a lot more expensive. Uh, than you know what an aspirin would be because it's a lot more complicated to manufacture, and you know that should change over time. But but what that has done and and just general increases in healthcare costs has pushed pushed that up, you know, pretty dramatically. And I think people that are paying attention think that that can't continue, right? Because a lot of people can't afford healthcare, and you're you know more and more people are pushed out, and the system ha it either will break or you know something will be done. So generally, there are two areas where people think. Um, you know, it could come from. It's either going to be government action or market forces. So we've seen a few market actions, and I'll, I put a few examples up here. You may have heard of the JP Morgan, Berkshire Hathaway, and Amazon. That was pretty well telegraphed. That was back in January of this year. So th these three huge companies, and I'm sure you're familiar with them, <coughs> got together, collaborated to come up with a, um, a way to get better quality and lower cost because the system just isn't working. So they're pushing back, you know, and, and one of the biggest personnel costs that companies have is healthcare, and it's increasing more every year. I mean, when I was at my last firm, <coughs> you know, every year they'd be looking for a new thing, and they'd change the plan a little bit, and, and our share as employees would increase, you know, by like more than their share, but everyone was still going up. So, so you can see there's, there's been there's efforts there. And then also, uh, pharmacies, they've put on formu formula restrictions. I don't know if anyone... You know, it needs a specific drug, and generally if there are two or three drugs in a class, the pharmacy will pick one, and it may not work the best for everyone, but they'll make a deal on that, and they will um, just pick one and restrict the rest because they got a deal, and that's to keep the cost down. Um, so it kind of hurts the patient a little bit, um, but it does give them a negotiating edge. So, and then another thing was this Civica RX. A lot of hospitals got together uh, about a month or two ago, and there was a shortage of generics out there. So they decided to create their own generics company because the hospitals did not have critical medicines um, on their own. And then another thing that, that, that's done uh, to keep uh, prices down is, is the, the payers drown you in red tape. So I don't know if anyone's you know, had something that they need, either a pharmaceutical product or a procedure. You, know, you can't just go and get it. You, know, you have to go through all these what are called step edits or, you know, it's just, and they, and they do that for a reason. They, they don't want you to use the service, you know, that, that they're trying to keep the cost down. So those are some market actions that have been taking place to fight uh, that. And on the government side, you know, pretty much nothing has been done. Um, you know, I don't know if, it kind of seems like we maybe even moved backwards a little bit, uh, you know, to do something. But, you know, I think employers probably, you know, business probably really would appreciate some sort of, some amount of that healthcare burden being taken off their shoulders because it's just not working. Um, and another interesting thing we talked about at the panel was uh, outcomes and value-based pricing. Now, this is an interesting thing. Some of the highest-priced drugs out there uh, have tried to do this 
this plan where they, where the patient only pays for the drug, or the the managed care company or the insurance company only pays for the drug if it ends up working, right? So it's there's I I provided a four examples up here: Entresto, Repatha, Timraya, which actually was just approved last last year in 2017, on Patro. These are these are these are very cutting edge um, drugs in the interference RNA space, and Timraya is in the CART T. I don't know if anyone's heard of that. Which which one? On Patro. Uh, Kim Raya, yeah, that's that's a CART T. That's chimeric antigen receptor T cell. So basically, it's it's a fascinating uh, cancer therapy. It's for blood cancers. Basically, what they do is they will take the blood out of your system, right, uh, with the T cells, the immune cells, which go around and you know keep you healthy. They'll take them into the lab and they'll modify them so that they can recognize the cancer cells. Then they'll re-inject them in the patient. Very expensive because you got to do all this this crazy stuff. Yeah, it is. There were two drugs approved, Timraya and Yaskarta, uh, were both approved last August, September, something like that. And, uh, you know, it's it, CAR-T. It's called CAR-T. There are only two drugs approved so far, so you'll usually be able to find it if you search for it. But it's chimeric antigen receptor T cells. And, you know, the chimeric part is, you know, from your Greek myths or whatever. You know, they're, they're modifying it. You know, the chimera had, I think, two heads or something like that. So the, you know it's got it's got these um, this fusion of of uh, of, D, of DNA. I'm not a scientist, but you know anyway, it's a fusion of this. So it's, so it, it, it's able to recognize the cancer cells. That's that's the important message that we want to get across. And you can you can take a look. It's it's really fascinating actually. Uh, CAR T C A R dash T. Yeah. And there are two companies that, that have it, Novartis and anyway, but you'll find it. Yeah, it was approved by the FDA last year, last like August, around August, the end of the summer. Uh, so then transparency is another issue. I think we probably all know we don't know how much the healthcare or products, healthcare products we want to use cost until like much later. And there's no other there's no other place like that. I mean, you know, you go into the store and you want to buy something. I mean, the price is right there. But if you have a healthcare service, like you go to your doctor or you need some kind of medication, you don't know the price until well after, and they can pretty much charge what they want. There's no restriction on that, uh, and it and it makes it very hard to compare prices. Um, you know, there's always the example of the MRI. Um, you know, where it's it's four hundred dollars over here, and then it's you know two thousand dollars over here, but nobody knows because they just don't post the prices. So that is a big issue, and that could solve a lot of the problems that we have in healthcare prices. There's some examples where there is transparency. Uh, LASIK, you know, for eye surgery, uh, Botox injections, and regenerative medicine. And the interesting thing about all three of these is they're not covered by insurance. So they're, they're private pay. You know, you pay out of your pocket if you want these services. So does that mean we need to get rid of insurance, and that would help align the prices? Because really, who, who could afford these $150,000 therapies if it wasn't for insurance? So you could kind of look at it look at it as insurance is enabling this kind of dysregulation of prices. So just, you know, just some of the thoughts from the panel. Uh, investors will be uh, So the regulatory environment, very important for any drug that's going through any drug or device. So all drugs, they need to be approved before they can be available commercially. And, and the process that a drug has to go through, it's, it's pretty, pretty complex. There's a preclinical phase, which is done in the lab with you know, animals and, and test tubes and things like that. And as soon as they're pretty sure that the drug is, is safe, then they can go into a phase one trial. And a phase one trial is really just looking to see is the drug going to harm, harm anyone. And I, th I think most, most trials focus on healthy people. Some don't because of the nature of the drug or the disease. But most look at, uh, at, at whether or not it is safe. Uh, if it's proven safe, then they move to a phase two trial. The phase two trial is where you really want to see if it works. You know, does it have some kind of efficacy? And there's also, you know, the safety component is always there no matter where you are. And that's called proof of concept. So if you finish your phase two trial and the, out, the outcome is good, then you move on to phase three. And phase threes are where it gets a little bit more expensive. They're much larger. 
really interact with the FDA quite a bit to design the trial so that they'll accept the results if they're positive. Um, you know, there's several thousand people generally that are included in these trials, you know, depending on the disease and how efficacious the drug is, how well it works. Uh, so when you get done with that phase two trial, which can also take up to three years, you know, it, again, it depends on the disease. Uh, then you go before the FDA with all your data and uh, see if they'll approve you. And it's not, it's not as easy as it seems. I mean, a lot of times data will come out and it'll show that the drug works. It'll show that it's safe. But there's so many other factors that have to be examined by the FDA. I mean, the manufacturing side of things. You know, is the manufacturer doing things in a safe way? Um, uh, you know, the labeling. Is the labeling correct on how it should be prescribed and things like that? So there's a lot of other factors that go in play and before it can get approved. And then the other, uh, the other area of interest is the authority. Uh, that's in Europe. They have a similar process as the U.S. Generally, a company, they'll get something approved in the U.S. because the U.S. is the most uh, profitable market because you charge the highest price and there's a big population. Uh, EMA is number two, generally. Um, prices are negotiated by individual governments, so like France or Germany. Uh, Negotiate their own prices, and you know they're they're very similar, and there's there's a lot of collaboration between the FDA and the EMA, um, which is a good thing I think because they can um, you know focus on on the key issues and ensure that the population gets what they need. And then um, you know just one difference between the EMA and the FDA is when you're in the FDA process, you have the phase one, two, three, and, and there's a lot of interaction, especially after you submit. Or um, your drug for approval. Uh, in EMA, you pretty much submit it. They have some questions that come back to you. You answer the questions, and that's it. You don't interact as much, which can be a little bit harmful uh, because sometimes you know they don't understand. And, and one of the, one of the things about these regulatory agencies is they're kind of back. You know, they're conservative. They're backward looking, right? They, they're they're not on the cutting edge of technology. Um, you know, like some of those the the Kimraya, the CART T. You know, that's cutting edge technology, and you know, they, they just don't have the people there, the scientists at the FDA, who are familiar with this new, you know, this new drug in and of itself. So that's another problem that they face. Um, so also at the FDA, new commissioner there, uh, he runs the place, uh, Scott Gottlieb. He's seen as a, a pretty good appointee, trying to streamline the approval process. Um, he's, he's working on a, a number of things. You know, it's very hard to get an organization like that to uh, change, right, just because the leader changes organization is you know, stuck in place. Uh, but he is trying to do what's called an adaptive design. And the adaptive design allows you to change the trial as you see the data come out. And there's, there's pluses and minuses with that. I mean, one that allows you to really focus on the population that it might help, and you don't waste money and time on a trial that's not going not gonna to work. Um, but also, you know, it does allow for, you know, maybe some adjustment of data to happen, and, and uh, you know, we may not get the cleanest, the cleanest result. So there's, there's positives and negatives there. Um, and then, you know, another thing I want to bring up, you know, I, I cover the small cap space. And these companies have limited funds. You know, some of them are running, you know, spending only a million dollars a month on, on their development, which is not that much when you know, there's billion dollar drugs out there. And they just don't have that close relationship with the FDA. And they don't have the ability to set the academic and, and research environment in a way where the FDA sees where their drug fits in it, if I explain that right. I mean, they just don't, they don't have the ability to educate the regulatory agencies so that they can understand how the drug works, why it's safe, and why it's effective. So they have a little bit harder difficulty, or a little bit harder time um, getting drugs approved than, than a large company like Pfizer or Merck or somebody like that would. Uh, so that was what we talked about on the regulatory environment. Now the financing environment, you know, these, these small cap guys that I cover, they're always needing capital. You know, they don't generate revenues. They, um, you know, they have great ideas, uh, but they, they need to fund it uh, by tapping the market. And, you know, we talked about uh, just the, the cycle. Uh, if everyone can think back a few years of 2015, in the biotech space, it was, it was easy to get capital. I mean, you can see that if you look at a chart, a, bio, a chart of biotech stocks how it did, it, it pretty much peaked in 2015. And companies were getting, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to develop drugs in the very early stages. Uh, but that changed a lot in the succeeding years. Uh, so it, it got a lot more difficult in 2016 and 17. It started to come back a little bit. 
So on, in our panel on Monday, we just talked about some of the things that uh, you know we're facing right now. So ca companies can raise capital. Uh, it, it has been dilutive in a number of cases. So, so the share price is a little bit lower than what previous shareholders had got. Even though the company has advanced as planned, um, you know, the share price has come down and there's been some dilution. There's also a lot of warrants. I don't know if everyone's familiar with warrants. Warrants, warrants are evil. I mean, if you're a previous shareholder, if you're not, <laughs> if you got the warrant, they're, they're great. But basically, the warrants give you a right to buy the stock at a certain price, and they really can dilute pretty severely uh, previous shareholders. So you really got to pay attention to that um, because you know the the company may be worth a hundred million dollars. But if they double their share count, then, well, you just lost half of your value, even though the company's still the same. So something you have to watch out for. And, and then an interesting thing that I came up with, I was actually asked to give a, a talk about um, venture capital and biotech a couple months ago. I was just sort of searching around, looking for interesting topics to talk about, and uh, realized that Chinese capital has really surged in the last, I don't know, six quarters or so um, in the venture capital biotech space. So, you know, I took a look at, uh, you know, what, what that was all about. So apparently what, what the Chinese really have tried to do is allocate a lot of capital towards technology and uh, healthcare and biotech in particular. They're doing it inside the country, inside China, but they're also expanding out into other areas as well. And, you know, some of the biggest deals that have taken place uh, so far this year were actually funded by Chinese capital. Now, that's great in some ways because, you know, it allows the research and development to continue. Uh, but there are certain strings attached. And, you know, we've probably heard this in the news. You know, China wants to get that technology and then build on it themselves. Um, so they'll, they'll take a stake in a company and they'll try to, you know, somehow capture the IP, either get it back to China for production uh, or, you know, somehow, uh, you know, that technology and, and transfer it to another company in China. You know, I mean, that's the goal. They, they really want the IP. And the U.S. is, you know, by far, by far, I mean, it's really amazing how far ahead the U.S. is and the rest of the world in terms of biotech, um, you know, research and capability. But, you know, we're, we're, we're slowing and the others are accelerating. So it's, it's uh, you know, eventually they'll, they'll catch up if we, if we don't move too far. Um, but uh, yeah, there's strings attached. You got to be careful, you know, when you take capital, um, because it's risky. So those are the topics that we discussed on the financing side of things. Let me see. So and then, and then the, uh, the last question I asked the panel was, you know, what um, what were some of the areas outside of your own company where you see some some emerging interesting things in biotech? And I think three out of the five CEOs. That artificial intelligence was um, was an issue. That can be used in so many ways. You know, if you go back to the pricing slide, the cost. Um, you know, one of the things that we have to face is the high cost of of you know pharmaceutical development. Well, you know, AI could potentially help there by streamlining trials, by optimizing trials. You know, a lot of times uh, drugs are used in individuals where it doesn't work. That's wasted. I mean, not only is it wasted, but you're exposing that patient to uh, side effects and things like that that could that could happen from uh, from that drug. So AI can actually help identify that because it could take all this data in. It can look at the genetic profile of that individual and say, you know, hey, the person with this genetic profile does not respond to that drug. So let's try a different therapy. So you've saved one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, you know, because you didn't give them the therapy. You saved them the risk of being exposed to the side effects of that drug, and also you've you've started another therapy sooner. Um, if it's available, uh, that may work better for them. So it's not easy to do, but it, it, AI can help uh, do that. Uh, what else did I put up there? Uh, you know, uh, diagnosis is another thing. I, I don't know if anyone's heard of Watson, uh, that IBM computer. That, that's actually been used to help diagnose. You know, a physician can only hold so much things in their mind, right? I mean, I'm sure we've all gone to the doctor and they've given us a diagnosis that we later found out was not correct, right? And I think this is probably one of the best areas where artificial, can, artificial intelligence can help because it can show you all the options that it could be and you can help narrow it down and really leverage that physician's ability to diagnose a problem. So that's really great for patients, great for costs, um, kind of solves everything. So, so AI is going to have to save us, I, I guess that's the point. 
Another interesting area, uh, the microbiome. Um, you know, we, I guess probably in the last five years, this has really started to emerge as a very interesting area. Uh, is everyone familiar with the microbiome? It's like your gut, all the bacteria in your gut. Um, you know, you're supposed to eat yogurt, kimchi, and sauerkraut, stuff like that. You know, it helps, helps it. And, you know, people had ignored it. Not, you know, I mean, if it's, if it's imbalanced, then we have stomach problems. But we really didn't realize how impactful it is on our health. And there's a lot of research emerging now. And it's fun to read. If you have time, you know, search about it on the internet. You'll find some really interesting articles. Um, it's very important for general health. Uh, your diet is very important. I mean, we all kind of know that your diet's important for your health, but it's also important for your microbiome, which is important for your health. So there's kind of a double, uh, double thing. And just some other, other examples of this. We didn't talk about this in the panel, but just some stuff I found out. You know, there's actually research that shows that imbalances uh, are linked to inflammatory bowel disease, which actually makes sense, metabolic disease and depression. So even the way your mind is working is affected by your microbiome. Well, you know, all drugs should go through some kind of testing process. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's hard to say about any individual probi probiotic. You know, a lot of times you got to be careful with those uh, with those recommended supplements and if they're efficacious or not. You know, a lot of those are not FDA approved. You know, they haven't gone through any any testing process to make sure they work. But you know, we do know that like eating yogurt or sauerkraut is very helpful if you have you know some, some gut issues. So um, some of that stuff does work. But what this is saying is we need to pay a lot more attention to it and spend some time doing research here. But the reason research isn't done here is because there's no money in it, right? You can't charge thousand dollars a pill for you know probiotics right you can charge you know 30 cents or whatever so so you know we're, we're facing some issues but you know there are there there is research done and that's why it, it's probably wise for for us to you know take a look here and see what the research is showing um, and then another thing that's interesting you know the use of of uh, you know everyone has a mobile phone and a lot of people have the watch the Fitbit or the Apple watch or whatever uh, it really allows you to monitor things real time. Uh, you know, if you if if you if you have a heart attack or any other kind of uh, you know arrhythmia or something like that, I was actually in a meeting, and this guy pulled out his iPhone and this little this little rectangular pad, metal pad. He set it down and he put his fingers on it, and it gave him his EKG, which I didn't even know was possible. I thought you had stuff on your chest, but it was right there because he had some kind of arrhythmia, and he was able to test it. Um, you know, just the, the ability to monitor is a really big impact for health, right? And real time. I mean, if it's on your wrist, you know, if, you, if you're having some kind of issue you're like, that you know, can be measured through either your temperature, or your pulse, or some other thing, uh, you know, it's, it's real time data and, you know, can have a great benefit. So that was another thing that, uh, that was mentioned as a, um, as a benefit. Well, let's see. I, I had some slides in here that were just kind of interesting from, from before, just showing venture capital funding. Uh, this is actually not just biotech, but all areas. And you see it's, it's really increased quite a bit over the last you know, eight quarters or so. Um, so as a subset of that, we can see where that money has gone. A lot of it's gone to internet, and uh, the second largest area is healthcare. And a lot of those, there's actually a, a hybrid of healthcare and internet uh, or technology, actually. I think that probably includes technology, too, which is what I was talking about with the health monitoring, you know, with the, with the watches and, and, and software that will, you know, help measure your health on a real-time basis. Um, so it's just interesting to see where the, where the capital is going and where ideas are seen. And, and one interesting thing I got from some investors is they were saying, you know, we like technology, which is Internet, and you know we like healthcare, but the regulatory risk in healthcare is so high that you know if we have to choose, you know, all things being equal, we're going to go to the internet. So it was just kind of an interesting thing that I thought, you know, you're right because if you get an app to work, you know, yeah, you don't, yeah, it just works, you know, <laughs> you just get it out there. But if you have a drug that works, well, you got this long process, a very risky long process you have to go through to get it. So when I saw this chart, it kind of put that into relief for me, and I thought it, it kind of supported that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
It's, you know, and I, I think one of the reasons that happened is the FDA does not have a sufficient funding to address all of the, um, all the things that come across their desk. You know, they're, they're very busy and they have to make, you know, I, I don't, I have not seen a submission, but I've seen people who've done the submissions and they say, you know, there's a stack like this of data that goes in for a drug. You know, just binders and binders of information. And, you know, it's, it's, it's daunting. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's very difficult to go through. And, and you know, if you're the FDA, you have, you have a responsibility to go through all that and make sure it's safe and, you know, safe and, and effective. Um, so, you know, something's definitely got to be done. Um, you know, because the human body is a complex thing, we have to look at a lot of different things. But, you know, we get to a point where we just, we just get stuck. Um, so, interesting chart just on venture capital in the second quarter. Hopefully the third quarter will be out soon, see if that trend had continued. Um, this is just another thing just to put venture capital into um, perspective. You can see that uh, healthcare devices and supplies and healthcare services and systems, which is an orange, light and dark orange, are um, part of that. And then pharma and biotech, there's another part down there in the, in the blue. So it makes up a, a material part of the you know, early stage. The, one, the reason I like to look at venture capital is that is a lot of times where the emerging things are happening. Like these drug companies, you know, it takes 10 to 15 years to get a drug from initial concept to in, in, you know, in, in approved, right? So, so that's kind of old technology, right? By the time it gets, you know, it gets to the phase two trials. Um, but, you know, in venture capital, you can kind of see what they think the, the future will be. So that's why I like to look at, at, at what's going on with them. Um, this was just another interesting slide that I just wanted to include in case we had time. This is show, and it's a little bit old, it's from 2016, but it just, it just shows some of the, the capital outlays in these different areas. And yeah, these, these are just, just some more interesting slides. So I thought I'd open it up for questions. You know, we got about 10 minutes or so. I, I wanted to make sure I didn't, I wanted to stay kind of focused on the areas that you're interested in. I mean. I can talk about individual drugs, which might not be interesting, but I can talk about larger picture things as, as well, if you'd like. Sure. Yeah, so if you go to SC, in fact, actually I should go to the last slide. Or well, not that one. I'm right here. Did it come up? There we go. So you can go to scr.zax.com and you can find my research. So I cover about 14 companies. Um, and you can also find, uh, you know, on, on Twitter. That's a great place to go to if you want to follow me. And whenever news comes out on any of my companies, You'll see it there, and then you can follow the link to read it. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so the companies that we cover actually fund our research, right? Um, so that's, 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 that's how it's paid for. And we post it on a few different areas. We have it in uh, Yahoo Finance is probably the, the most popular area where people find it. That's a great place to go uh, for the companies we cover. But you can also sign up on Zach's to get it emailed to you on Friday. So this is actually really great. There's only a link, you know, so it's not sending you all these documents to, to fill up your, your data and your, and, your, and your emails, everything. But it's just a, it's a one-page thing. It has all the research we did that week. You can also go to scr.zax.com, and you'll see a list of the analysts, and then you can click on them and see what they cover. So if you click on mine, you'll look and you'll find all the companies that, that are under my coverage. So I just... <coughs> Yes, companies that I'm recommending. We, we have a target price. The way we do our recommendations is we have a target price, and it's the investor's responsibility to look at the current price and the target price and you know, determine kind of how much upside there is. We don't have buy, hold, or sell ratings. There's a whole host of issues related to that. Um, so we've simplified it and said, you, know, you can tell how much we like the stock by how much upside there is between the target price. Uh, there are there is a paid subscription uh, that, that's available, and there's extra services that come with it. 
Um, but if you just want to read the research, you just go to the site and it's there. Sure, well, actually, there's one that I just initiated on Monday called Dyadic International, and this is actually a fascinating company. They make biologic proteins out of a fungus. So right now, a lot of the biologics that are out there, like Humira, has anyone heard of Humira? Okay, that's a biologic. It's made from, from cells. Um, it's a very difficult, expensive, and time-consuming process, uh, and they use what are called Chinese hamster ovary cells. I mean, this is crazy. I mean, where did that come from? But that's what they use, Chinese hamster ovary cells. Uh, well, they're called biologics. Yeah, it's a class of drug that are manufactured by living cells, and these are, are most of the newest drugs today, and they're very expensive. Hmm? No, 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 no. Oh, yeah, dyadic, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm giving out too much information. It's, yeah, dyadic, D-Y-A-I, ticker symbol D-Y-A-I. They were actually were trading at cash, which is pretty much unheard of in a um, development company. And they're working on a new way to produce biologics, which is substantially more productive. The problem is there's, there's already a system in place to support um, the, the Chinese hamster ovary cells, right? They're, they're entrenched, right? Uh, Samsung, which is you know, a huge company, they make phones, but they also make biologics. And they've invested billions uh, in the current system. And you know, them and other companies are at risk if it changes. So there's, there's a lot of resistance to it, even though it's more productive. So this small company, Dyadic International, is working on validating uh, their their um, expression system. It's just a cell, it's a fung fungal cell. And actually, you think fungal cells are bad, but actually they're a lot better um, because of the purity of the output compared to mammalian cells, like these hamster cells. So you actually would prefer, uh, prefer the fungal cell because there aren't viruses associated with it. If you use animal cells to do that, there could be viruses associated with it. So it's cleaner, it's more prolific, you know, it just produces a lot more. Um, and they're working with a lot of the big names uh, in the pharmaceutical world right now to develop a drug using this system. So eventually, if it's used, if it gets in place, if it displaces this, this, the Chinese hamster ovary cells, then they'll get a royalty on every, you know, every unit made. So I'm anticipating that's going to happen in about the mid-2020s. It does take a long time. Uh, but if it does, you know, these guys could make up a material portion of this 200 plus billion dollar market. So let's say they get 10%, they get a 1% royalty on 10% of that market, you can do the math. You know, that's, yeah, D-Y-A-I. Yep. Companies, yep, yes, right. Yeah, and there's, there's, Exactly, I get that question every time. And yes, I mean, you know, it is. It is a conflict of interest. And the way we respond is that our research is educating the investor on how to value the company. If you don't like the way we've approached it, if, if you think we're too aggressive in terms of what price they can get, you can look and, and, and make an adjustment and, and, and adjust the valuation accordingly. We, you know, we disclose the whole process that we go through. So if you read the research report on DYAI, you'll see what the current market is, the size of the market, you know, it's all footnoted and you know, you can see where it comes from. So we try to make it very, you know, unbiased by using other resources and by substantiating everything we say. So if, if you don't agree with, you know, certain portions of it, then you can make that adjustment. And you know, I used to do that too with Wall Street, when I was an analyst, uh, you know, I'd use Wall Street models, I'd look at what they had and I'd say, hey, you know, you think this is gonna go up 10% next year, I think it's gonna be five. So I put that in and you know, it adjusted accordingly. So um, you know, I think even though the research, even though the concern exists that it may be biased, um, there's still value in it um, for the investor because it's a starting point. When I was an analyst, we always did our own research, but we used Wall Street research as a way to get started, right? To understand what the factors were that were driving the stock price, who the competitors were, you know, what kind of pricing could be achieved, Things like that. Yes, well, paid by the companies that we cover. 
Um, well, no, they pay Zach's and in the, in the, yeah. Mm, no, no, I don't think so. Uh, not, not the, not the quantitative. Definitely not the quantitative. That's, that's not. That's just a black box. There's no, there's no um, human input. Sure, sure. I, I don't, I don't go down that route. I, I'm not a quant guy. I mean, I'll use it to like narrow down the universe, but I'm a fundamental guy. So. Um, uh, well, another company that's interesting is Antares, A-T-R-S. They recently had uh, an approval of the EpiPen. They're working with Teva Pharmaceuticals. They're an Israeli company. Uh, they um, partner with Antares, who makes injectors. So and, uh, Teva makes the drug. Antares makes the injector. They work together. So Teva is great because they have penetration to all the drugstores and pharmacies you know, and everywhere. So if you work with a big company like that, you get great distribution. So uh, their Epi, EpiPen, I don't know if you remember the EpiPen story, you know, Mylan had it and it was all over the news. There's a shortage of that now. So they just got approved like a month and a half ago uh, for that. So they can start selling it. They're gonna see, start to see benefits from that Antares. very soon. Yes, Antares, because they make the, it's a partnership. Teva, Antares, they got their combination product approved uh, for the epinephrine pen. Uh, so, you know, hopefully before the end of the year, they start seeing sales and they have the only Generic, so generics are interesting. There's, there's generics that can be substituted when you go to the pharmacy, which is a good thing because uh, the patient doesn't have any say in it, the insurance companies force it, right? And there's, then there's uh, generics that can't be substituted. Um, Antares has the one that can be substituted. So they're gonna get market penetration, good, good thing. Uh, and, and then also just a few days ago, they had their Zyosted uh, injector for testos low testosterone approved just on Monday. And that actually is a much bigger deal than the epinephrine pen because they own the whole thing in-house. Um, so that was a great, uh, a great um, uh, feather in the cap for them. So I anticipate you know, we're going to see continued improvement in that stock price as those revenues roll in. Um, well, let me, you know, my numbers are always changing. So, I mean, you know, I'm always adopting them to, um, to you know, the current, Situation, but let me see if I can pull up my. Let you, let you see. Yeah, I think I have a five dollar target on there. I'll just pull up my latest report. So. Um. Oh, here we can. I'll just show you. This is what our research looks like right here. Is it coming up? Oh, it's not coming up. That's interesting. Um, hmm. Maybe if I, uh, there was a change made on this. Projector only? No. Display. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, well, I'm sorry. I apologize. I, I don't know why it's not showing the same thing up there. So, okay, I have a, um, $5 target, it was trading at $3.26 on Monday, uh, and I increased that target by, I think, about a dollar based on the Zyosted approval. Um, I'm sorry it's not up there, because you can see all I'm looking at. But you can go on scr.zax.com, and you can find uh, the research on there, and you can, uh, you can have a peruse it <laughs> at your convenience. So any other questions? I'm not. Sounds like ligand or something. What is it? I don't know, but I mean, I'm familiar with that. I mean, you know, ligands are used to connect uh, T cells to cancer cells and things like that. It's probably a fascinating technology, but I don't cover that one. You know, the one thing about biotech is I used to cover retail, which is actually very easy. You know, one retailer is very similar to another retailer. And, you know, if you know one, you kind of know them all. But it's radically different in biotech. I mean, you can know one company in cancer space focused on lung cancer, uh, and you could have another one that's focused on lung cancer but has a different technology, and the dynamics are totally different. Um, you know, it's just, it's just crazy the way it is because they use a different mechanism of action. 
Uh, you know, one might use the CAR-T, which I talked about, but other, another might use uh, interference RNA, and they may be working on a different subset of cancer. You know, it's, it's very, it's very, you know, it's very complicated. So I, you know, the, and that's the role of the analyst is educate the investor on what these differences are and how to recognize them and quantify them, right? Because in the end, we're trying to quantify um, the value of the stock. So I think we have time for one more question. One more interesting in the back. No? All right. All right, well, thank you for listening. Appreciate it. Hopefully it was uh, informative and helpful.